Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be here. Uh, Gretchen, thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, this evening. Um, you know, <clears throat> when we had first uh, initially started having the conversations about this event, we weren't exactly sure uh, who was going to be in attendance. Uh, the hope was that there would be more youth involved and, you know, um, I would be able to speak directly to them and, and those individuals that are um, directly impacted by uh, systemic oppression, by trauma, uh, by um, racism, by economic deprivation, poverty, uh, violence, uh, so on and so forth, all um, essentially getting us to the point of um, needing to, to deal with and find other ways and modalities to deal with mental health. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case in, in this particular scenario. And so one of the things that I enjoy is having that level of flexibility, right? To be able to dive in and, and be in communion and conversation with people, no matter what your backgrounds are, no matter where you are currently. Um, it is my assumption that every one of you uh, is either caring for, has cared for, um, or has love for uh, a youth or child that is struggling with uh, a mental health issue. It could be anger, it could be depression, it could be anxiety, it could be substance abuse, right? Um, violent tendencies. And so uh, I, as, as, as Gretchen is aware, I don't like to do um, in any of my keynotes or presentations I don't like it to be an I talk, you listen type of scenario. Um, I'm one that's really big on conversation and building community. And so my plan is to give you a, a brief synopsis of who I am, uh, what got me to this point, why I'm doing the work that I'm doing uh, with the hope and expectation that the latter part of this presentation can be one of communal conversation. Uh, I just want to give you all a, a background of, of who I am and, and why this work is important and why I'm even here, right? Um, and so to start that, I, I, you know, I, I like to make it known that um, my connection to Massachusetts comes by way of my wife. Um, she was born and raised in the Berkshires. Uh, and though I have not visited for uh, a multitude of reasons that may come up throughout the, uh, the course of this conversation, um, you know, uh, it, 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 is, it is with love and respect for her and her experience as a child um, and the experience of my three stepdaughters who were also born in uh, the Berkshires uh, that I am here. Um, I was born and raised, as Gretchen mentioned, in Baltimore. Um, I've lived about five years in New Jersey, about a year and a half in Alexandria, and then recently bought and purchased a home in my um, in my hometown of Baltimore. What's interesting about where I am right now, I'm sitting in my sunroom. Uh, 60 years ago, the community that I live in, it was illegal for black people to own property. It was illegal for black people to live. And this community that I live in is actually the first garden community in America. And a lot of the, um, the discriminatory practices of today's real estate market or the, the, of the real estate market in, in over the past 50, 60 years actually originated in Baltimore with redlining, blockbusting. Um, and so that just goes to show that we have in a lot of ways made some levels of improvement societally. Um, but I think we can all agree that we still have a, a ways to go. And so um, again, the hope and expectation is that we find some level of uh, relatability uh, through this presentation and we find something of value uh, that we can take back to the individuals that we care for. Uh, I, as I mentioned, I was born and raised in Baltimore and West Baltimore. I was born in the 80s and so I grew up while major cities like New York and Chicago were experiencing the crack epidemic, right? Baltimore was experiencing a heroin epidemic. And often when I, when I tell people that I'm from Baltimore, the first thing that I'm asked is, uh, was it as bad as The Wire showed that it was? Because right? generally most people only know about the Ravens, the Orioles, crabs, and The Wire. And um, 
and I often say that The Wire was television. So imagine taking the images portrayed in that HBO show uh, and having to live through them. And that was my life. I was raised by a single mother. Uh, my father was addicted to heroin um, for the majority of my childhood into early adulthood. And so he and I didn't have a, a, a good relationship. Um, I remember moments where my father was often too high to notice me or recognize who I was. Uh, and then other times when he was sober, he was looking to get a hit and begging me and asking me for money. Um, the other moments of quality time that I spent with my father um, was separated by bulletproof glass at correctional institutions. Right? And so I grew up with a strong sense of uh, not belonging, of feeling as if my presence, my mere presence uh, was enough to drive away a man who was supposed to love me unconditionally, right? And so taking that and wearing that burden as a child, um, it only carried on throughout other areas of my life. I was fortunate to, despite living in very impoverished community, uh, a lot of dilapidation, a lot of crime, a lot of violence, um, you know, a lot of drugs, I was fortunate to, to go to some really great schools. My mother knew uh, what, what potential could exist for me uh, had she not gotten me a better education. And so she put me in schools that were dominated by people who didn't look like me. And though the value of education academically was greater, what my mother didn't know is that experience would give me education in my difference. Uh, it would give me education in the prejudice that existed, that stripped away the innocence of a nine-year-old, a 10-year-old, an 11-year-old, that would ultimately put me in a box that I would fight for the next 20 years to constantly get out of. I was, um, when I was in school, I was expected to be the quintessential black person. And I don't know what that is. I'm 38 years old this year, and I still don't know what the quintessential Black person is. Um, but the expectations that were set on to me, um, they were of a magnitude uh, that I don't think any person, regardless of race or religion or sexual preference and orientation, uh, could match. Um, I was expected to fail. I was put into a remedial English class in middle school in sixth grade. And what was interesting is that the school, they tried to disguise it as an academic enrichment program. The difference was while all the other students were learning and reading Macbeth, I was reading a book called The Contender, which was about a black kid from Harlem who used uh, boxing to escape his way out of um, poverty. Uh, and everyone in that class looked like me. And it was challenging to see what type of academic enrichment um, I was experiencing um, when the reading level of that book was lower than what it took to get into the school in the first place. And it was of no consequence uh, based off of my behavior. I never had behavioral issues. Um, I had issues with people telling me who I was, who I couldn't be, uh, and ultimately who they expected me to be without understanding and taking into account all of what I was experiencing and dealing with outside the confines of that school. And so what that school taught me, not only did it teach me that I was different, but it gave me the, the ability to fight and use my words. Um, I would finish my, my assignments and I would ultimately go and, and read the dictionary, right? Because I had to find ways to combat what I was experiencing in a way that would not land me in getting kicked out, that wouldn't land me in somebody's handcuffs. Uh, and so using the written word became my escape. It became the way that I fought back. And even with that, I was still placed in this box. I was, ex I was told by one of my teachers in middle school that um, I would be lucky if I graduated from high school, that I would be lucky um, if, I, if I went to college. Um, I was told by a guidance counselor that the expectation of me societally was to be dead or in prison by 21. And this was all before I was 13. 
And so, again, growing up with this understanding of, of your difference, but then going back to a community that also didn't accept me, right? I was uh, in school, I, I, was, I was told that I, I spoke too black and I used urban vernacular and I was too much of a thug. Um, but in my neighborhood, I was told that I spoke too white. I used proper diction and, you know, uh, proper sentence structure, you know, verb, noun, predicate, those things, things that actually matter in, in language. Um, and so not, it, it, what was interesting to me and intriguing to me was that uh, I didn't know that uh, the way in which you could communicate had a color that was associated and attached to it. And so that was the first, the first level of, uh, of trauma that I had to, I had to overcome and, and, and endure. You know, as a, as a black kid growing up in Baltimore, hearing gunshots at night was a norm. It was almost like a doorbell, right? So that didn't scare me, um, you know, but driving through certain neighborhoods very much like the one that I live in right now scared me. That culminated into, I was about 14 years old and I was diagnosed with acute anxiety and depression. I was having these breathing episodes in the middle of the night, really difficult uh, breathing, uh, chest tightness, um, lightheadedness, um, numbness, numbness and tingling sensations. And again, in the black community, we don't talk about mental health, right? We don't talk about anxiety. We don't talk about depression. You know, um, these things are not, they're not, um, they are looked at in our community as being uh, symptoms of weakness. Uh, you know, especially as a male growing up, was raised to believe that being vulnerable meant you were weak. And so we, I had to grin and bear it, you know. Um, and so the first, the first um, course of treatment that was offered to me was medication. Another interesting moment was the medication they chose to put me on. It was Ritalin. Ritalin was a behavioral modification drug that was usually prescribed for people who had attention deficit disorder. Now, I'm a bit older than I was when I was, you know, in middle school, high school, but I've always had this contentment, right? I've never been, you, you rarely hear me raise my voice. You know, it is, it is the, the Virgo nature in me that keeps me calm, right? Uh, so I knew I didn't have behavioral issues. And my mom worked with um, mentally disabled uh, individuals the majority of my life. And so she knew the negative implications of being prescribed a medication that wasn't, that wouldn't help. She didn't want me to become addicted to it. And so we, we neglected, we, we, we denied it. We said, you know what, we'll figure it out on our own. And again, it was something that my mother still didn't believe I had. It was something that I still didn't believe that I had. You know, only well, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, was anxiety even looked at as a symptom, as, as a mental health issue separate from stress, you know? Um, and so uh, in, the, in the, 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 er, the mid to late 90s, uh, it still wasn't looked at as something as pervasive as it really is and as detrimental and harmful. And so I went the next 12 years essentially trying to figure it out, you know, periodically going through these episodes, self-medicating with marijuana occasionally, uh, picking up a bit of a, a habit in drinking. Um, but then I, I decided to get my life back on track and became a personal trainer, started a personal training business, um, a successful personal training business, independent, uh, had a few contracts with the gyms in the, in the area, was doing well. And then these episodes they returned again and they had gotten so severe that for about a month straight, every night, about 10 o'clock in the evening, I would leave my apartment and I would drive to the neighborhood um, hospital um, and I would sleep in my car in the parking lot of the emergency room because I had my first panic attack in the gym and I was terrified. I thought I was dying. I had never felt the level of pain that I felt, and I had never felt the level of fear that I felt. And I was shot at at 12 years old, and it still could not match what I was experiencing in my body. My grandfather, who kind of took over 
as my father um, during his period of, of addiction, he died when I was 10. And I didn't realize then the impact that his death had on me. Um, he died from a heart attack. And he was the guy that sent me off to school every day and was there to welcome me back. And I remember the day that he died, I'd left and he promised that he would be there. My grandfather never promises anything. He was never that type of person. And there was something happening. It, I, I was feeling some kind of intuitive pull. And I just, I, I remember walking out and saying, you promise you're gonna be here when I get back. And he was like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm here every day. Yes, I'm gonna be here, like go to school. And uh, when I got back home, he wasn't, he had already died. And so that that impacted me um, so, to a, to a degree where any time I would experience any kind of chest discomfort, my brain would automatically associate it with the death of my grandfather. And so any discomfort that I experienced, I automatically assumed I was about to die. Um, and so when I was 26, after experiencing these episodes daily, I took it upon myself to do something that, again, we don't normally do as black men in our community. And I went and saw a doctor. Uh, and then I was diagnosed officially with general, with severe generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and mild to severe major depressive disorder. And once again, the only course of treatment that was offered to me was prescription medication. After experiencing the level of panic and fear that a panic attack can bring on, when my doctor said this little white pill will help you never feel that fear again, I accepted it. What I didn't know is that the same medication that was given to me to help remedy the symptoms of my anxiety would actually create a disease that I knew far too well, and that was the disease of addiction. I ended up becoming addicted to, that anxiety, to those anxiety medications. Um, what I didn't know at the time was that I was only supposed to be on this medication for six weeks and it was supposed to be taken in conjunction with some, some level of therapy, whether cognitive behavioral therapy or, you know, talk therapy or just any kind of therapy. Um, and that was never an option. That was never offered. My, ther my, my doctor told me that my anxiety disorder was so severe that if I wanted to be normal, I would have to be on medication for the rest of my life. And like many of us, you know, we believe our doctors, we go to them because they are the experts and they are supposed to know more than we do. And after experiencing what I've experienced, I realized that that was, uh, the lie detector determined that was a lie. Um, and so uh, I spent two years addicted to anxiety medication. I was not only given uh, benzos for anxiety, but at the time, I was also going through severe migraines as a side effect to this medication. And so then I was given a prescription for Vicodin for my migraines. So at this time, I was, I was essentially taking a cocktail of prescriptions. I was taking, you know, Ativan for anxiety and Vicodin for migraines. And that culminated into an accidental overdose. And even at that point in time, I still didn't realize that I had a problem. Um, the examples of, 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 of addicts in my, that I had growing up were people that were addicted to crack, people that were addicted to heroin, and people that were addicted to alcohol, not people that were addicted to pills. You know, um, prescription drug addiction at that time was not as rampant, or at least it wasn't as well known uh, as it is now. And so I didn't have that context to, to judge what I was experiencing. I knew that I started off with one milligram a day and then that turned to five and then that switched to nine. And at the height, I was taking 18 milligrams of Ativan every day just to feel normal. And the other side of it, which didn't allow me to believe that what I was experiencing was an addiction was the fact that I was able to get that level of prescription from my doctor. It wasn't a situation where I had to go and resort to finding somebody on the street and getting a, a, a version of it, right? I could go back to my doctor and say, I need a refill and I would get it. Um, and so 
during that time, I also, you know, uh, I lost my business. My business faltered. I was usually too intoxicated to feel inspired enough to get up and train anyone. Uh, and so clients stopped coming. I stopped solidifying new business. I stopped growing, you know. Uh, I became very complacent um, in my own mess. And, uh, and, and, and as a result, I fell into a severe pit of depression. And it was through those, those moments of depression that I attempted suicide twice. You know, the first time I took a handful of pills, mixed it with alcohol, passed out and woke up the next day in a, in a, in a, in a tub full of vomit angry and upset, like, okay, I have to live this life all over again, right? And then the second time I was, you know, uh, I had gotten into an argument with someone, I had taken some pills and mixed it with alcohol yet again. And, you know, I, I had a, a registered firearm uh, in my home and I grabbed it and put it in my waistband and I, and I left. I left the house and I drove to a nearby gas station. And at the time I was smoking cigarettes. And so I went to the gas station and I bought a, a pack of cigarettes and I sat in the in my car in the gas station in the little corner where the vacuum cleaner and the air pumps are. Um, and I smoked and cried and smoked and cried and smoked and cried because I knew what I was there to do. And when I had really built up the the the, the courage to to do it, I reached into my waistband and the gun wasn't there. I was afraid at that point. I was like. I came in to kill myself, not catch a gun charge. So I got out the car and went back into the gas station thinking that I might have sat it down somewhere. Didn't want to, you know, anybody to call the police. I couldn't find it. I searched my car. I couldn't find it. But the beauty of that process was that, you know, during that time, I, I became so inundated with trying to find this firearm that I completely forgot what I was upset about. I was distracted, right? And so I got back into my car confused, drove back to my house, uh, my apartment, I walk in, I go in the kitchen to grab a glass of water and I see my handgun sitting on the counter right next to the microwave, right? And so I'd never put it in my waistband like I, I had thought. And, and that was a moment for me, you know, because I knew that if that, if I had that gun in my waistband when I went to that parking lot, I wasn't coming back, you know? Um, and that was a moment where I threw my hands up and, and, and I said, God, you win. Clearly, right? I'm, I'm supposed to be here for a reason. And I made it my mission to figure out what that reason was because even left to my own vices, I couldn't kill myself correctly, right? Um, and so I went back to my doctor and I told him that was the first time I realized and acknowledged and admitted that I had an addiction and that, I had, that something was wrong. And I, I begged him and I pleaded with him um, to help me get off of medication. Like I didn't want to take it anymore. And his suggestion was to put me on a different medication and not take me off of it completely. And so that was the moment that I realized that my, my doctor wasn't my doctor, he was my dealer. And, you know, um, I knew I needed to figure it out for myself, you know, and I pride myself on being a pretty intelligent person. And so I did what I do, right? And I, I went back and, and I utilized the information superhighway. You know, I Googled everything that I could about anxiety, about depression, about Ativan, about benzodiazepines, about, um, you know, uh, nutrition. I wanted to find stories of people who had healed themselves holistically and naturally. Um, and the first person that I, the first story I came across was a documentary called Fat, Sick and Nearly Dead with Joe Cross. He was a, um, an Australian guy who had uh, battled, uh, over, he was overweight and he had autoimmune disease and he was able to get off of his prescriptions from autoimmune disease because of juicing. The next video, the next documentary that I watched was Crazy Sexy Cancer with a woman named Chris Carr. And she had stage four cancer, an incurable cancer. And through changing her, her lifestyle, and adopting things like yoga and meditation and juicing and, you know, um, and becoming vegan, she was able to, to, to thrive in the face of stage four cancer. And so though their ailments were things of a physical component, I, being in the personal training business, I know that without proper mental health, physical health can't exist, right? It is the, it is the, 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 the beginning and the end of true, of, of true health and well-being. It starts in the mind. And so I felt like if they could do it, I could too. And so 
I, I, I started to adopt a juicing um, practice. And from juicing, I feel like yoga found me. Um, I was, I, I once had an aversion to yoga um, because being in the gym, the only yoga I saw was, was being done in, in the gym, you know? Um, and it, it looked weird. You know, it was people walking through the gym with no shoes on their feet and, you know, they wouldn't speak to anybody. They'd go into a dark room, they would close the door, they would stay in there for an hour and then they would come out, they'd be sweaty, they'd feel euphoric, they'd smile and still with no shoes on their feet and then they would leave, you know? And I was like, this isn't something I want to be a part of. Like, you know, if this is, if that's your thing, so be it. But what I, what I grew to understand was that yoga was more than the physical postures I thought it was. Right. It was the way we show up for ourselves. It's the way that we show up for others. It's the way that we show up for the world. Right. And so through yoga, uh, I then understood and learned the practices of meditation. Um, and I adopted these three modalities, ju juicing, yoga and meditation. And that grew to become what I consider to be my trinity of wellness. Um, you know, it, it, the, the, the juicing component adds the nutrition into the body, which ultimately helped deal, helped me deal with the withdrawal because I had to figure out how to get off of these, this, these pills. I had tried to stop cold Turkey and ended up in the hospital and the emergency room doctor told me that I was taking so many pills that if I stopped taking them, I would probably die. And so the same pills that were prescribed to me to help me with anxiety became an addiction but those, those same pills were then killing me when I wanted to get off of them and so I was like in a lose 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 situation and so I had to be diligent and intentional um in in my approach and by overloading my body with nutrients from juicing I would juice I would drink 32 ounces of green juice a day I was overloading my body with nutrients that help combat all of the negative symptoms that I was experiencing um, and then yoga helped me get into my physical body. It helped me to challenge myself, you know, mentally. Um, and then meditation helped to center me. It calmed me. It brought me uh, into a place of learning and understanding and respecting who I truly was, the individual that had been lost in all of those uh, negative experiences through school and throughout my life. Um, and from that point, I made it my mission uh, to share what worked for me with everyone else who would be willing to listen. And so that's how I, uh, uh, you know, that culminated into me uh, being able to, to write a book. It was Strong in the Broken Places, released May, May 30th of 2017. I celebrate four years of release this year. Um, and, you know, and, and all of this coming from a black kid from West Baltimore that was put in a remedial class in sixth grade. You know, now I am a published author, not only you know, able to, to, to have gotten a major publishing deal, um, but to be, to have my book released internationally. It's available in Canada and Australia um, and one other country that I can't think about right now. Um, and so what I learned through my journey is that we all have traumas. We all have things that we've been, I'm not gonna say cursed with, I'm gonna say blessed with. Uh, I thought anxiety was a death sentence. I thought it was a curse. I thought that I had done something horribly wrong in my life that I would be um, punished by having this mental health issue. And what I quickly came to realize is that anxiety was a blessing for me. It taught me things about myself that I wouldn't have ordinarily learned. It taught me how strong I was because strong was the only thing that I had. You know, um, I didn't have anybody to talk to. I didn't have anybody that was going through anxiety at the same time. I didn't know anybody that was struggling with prescription drug addiction. I had nobody. And the people that I did have around me, a few of them, you know, criticized me, you know? Uh, and, and so as a result, I went into my shell. Nobody knew how bad things had gotten, right? And so, um, you know, my life is a testament to our ability as human beings, right? Like we have the in incredible strength and tenacity um, to be redemptive, to take everything that we've gone through in our lives that has caused us pain, that has been uncomfortable, um, and we can turn them in to incredible opportunities for ourselves. You know, things don't happen to us, they happen for us, right? And, and I'm a firm believer that if we focus enough on the things 
on, on the one positive that can exist in any perceived negative, then we've put ourselves into a position where we've claimed that situation for ourselves, right? And so when I started telling my story through the written word and now verbally, my mission and my goal was to inspire and motivate one person every day to not give up, to not quit, uh, to believe in themselves if just for the moment, right? To see themselves represented in my struggle and that if I could do it, I'm just a regular kid from Baltimore. If I can do it, then I think anybody else can do it, as cliched as that may sound. You know, now I'm running a, 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 a tea business that I started a few months ago. Well, it's been over a year of process, but, you know, now my teas are being consumed by people like Gwyneth Paltrow and Tia Mori from Sister Sister, and I'm meeting people and building relationships with individuals that I used to look up to and admire and say, wow, I wish I had your life. And now I'm being invited into their homes, right? And so we have incredible strength and the incredible ability to just, to, to thrive in the face of adversity, you know, to turn our trials into triumphs. And, um, and, uh, and, and, I, and I'm grateful to be here uh, not only in, in physically in like and have breath in life, right? But to be able to share this with everyone listening uh, in the present moment. And so that is why I'm here. That is why the work is important. Um, that is why, you know, it was a very easy yes when I got the invitation to be a part of this event because I know that there are people that struggle and that are suffering, especially now considering what we're going through with COVID you know, I know too many people who have passed who didn't get a chance to say goodbye to their relatives. I know that we have children that are witnessing things, you know, happen to black and brown folks on television and they don't know how to make sense of it, right? They don't trust police. They don't trust community, right? They don't trust people that don't look like them. And some don't even trust people who look like them, right? And so, you know, my aim and my hope is to provide some level of, of, uh, of reprieve and relief from that stress and that anxiety. I'm a firm believer that anxiety resides in the future and depression resides in the past. And if we allow ourselves a space and moment to stay present, then we've created an environment where, where no, neither of those things can exist. And so that's, that's what I'm here for. And so I'm, I'm grateful, I'm appreciative. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being in attendance and I, I open uh, any comments, questions, or conversation that may come. Thank you.